I'm a conversation analyst. And so is Olaf from Frozen. I was watching Frozen when all of a sudden this happens. And then there's your ice business hey, hey, and, and don't we... worry about my ice business. Worry about your hair. What? I just fell off a cliff. You should see your hair. No, yours is turning white. White? It's... what? It's because she struck you, isn't it? Does it look bad? No, you hesitated. No, I, I didn't. There, there. Did you see that? Olaf is a conversation analyst. It, it's like Jar Jar Binks being able to find the Higgs boson. So why have I come to this conclusion? Because he's demonstrating knowledge of response relevance and minimization of silences. Let me explain. Let's start with the basics. I'm about to tell you something that you technically already know. Something that you do every day with finesse without even thinking about it. In a conversation, there is no time off. If you are silent, that silence does something. I'm not talking about those little silences that everybody wants to avoid and for which there are apparently endless YouTube videos on awkward silence management. No, even the tiniest micropause can do something and mean something in a conversation. You and I use these little silences to great effect all the time, but it's so habitual and so common and so fast that we don't even think about it. Until someone like Olaf comes along. What you have to know, and what you already know implicitly, is that when you say something, it creates what's called response relevance. That means that when you say something, you create an opening for someone to talk after you and to respond to what you've just said. You not only create an opening, though, you create a requirement. If your partner doesn't respond and there's silence instead, that silence does something. It's like not showing up to your sibling's wedding. Or not showing up to your own wedding. It creates what's called a noticeable absence, and it will be interpreted to mean things. Take this for example. It's from an actual phone call recorded for research. Well, I was going to call and ask you if you if I was playing golf this afternoon, if you wanted to go over to Robinson's with me. Can you walk? Would be too hard for you? Oh, darling, I don't know. I'm bleeding a little. Nancy is inviting her sister Emma to go shopping, but Emma has just had an operation. So Nancy checks as part of inviting Emma, can you walk? But after a short silence, Nancy adds one extra bit. Would it be too hard for you? This gives Emma an out. It provides a reason for why Emma might have to say no. By providing this, it's structurally easier now for Emma to decline the invite. Nancy gives this out after just 0.3 seconds. If Emma had been going to agree, she would have done so immediately. People are usually quick to jump in when they agree or when they're accepting or aligning or affiliating. But when there's a silence, it's one way to forecast that the impending answer is going to be a no, a rejection or a disagreement or a disaffiliation. At line two, there's response relevance for Emma to take a turn. It's her spot to either agree or disagree with being able to walk and to accept or decline the invitation. It's Emma's go, Emma's move. Nancy pursues the absent response in line three. The way that Nancy pursues it by giving that out suggests that Emma's silence has forecasted a possible rejection. Nancy pursues the response, but she also makes it structurally easier for Emma to say no. Back to Frozen. Anna has opened a relevant next turn by asking Kristoff to assess the state of her hair. But Kristoff hesitates for 1.7 seconds. That is forever in conversational terms. Or as conversation analyst Liz Stoko puts it in her TED talk, a lengthy pause can feel like this to your conversation partner. The point is, as we saw with the invitation in the phone call, that the silence does something. It can signal to the conversation partner that the response upcoming in the relevant response slot will likely be disagreeing, disaligning, something like that. As everyday conversationalists, we implicitly know this. Mike Rudnetta at Idea Channel has a fantastic video that circles around the idea of response relevance, except it deals with iMessages and read receipts. Read receipts are dangerous things because they make response relevance an issue where previously it wasn't really. There's definitely some response relevance at play with emails and texts and messages, but the timeline is much, much longer and slower. A response in regular conversation face to face is due within tenths of a second. Emails, 
Well, I know I'm pretty terrible at responding to emails, so let's say three days. That sounds optimistic. That's 2.6 million tenths of a second to give some comparison. So when we know that a response is relevant, but yet it is absent, we begin to assume the worst because long delays indicate often some kind of trouble with the response. What's upcoming is probably going to be disagreeing, disaligning, rejecting, or something along those lines. The frustration we feel about read receipts suggests that one of the reasons, one of many, that it's acceptable to have such a long response timeline with emails is that we can blame the fact that someone hasn't actually received the message yet. But back to Frozen Kristoff and the long delay. We can see during the silence that Kristoff goes through a series of facial contortions. This proves that Kristoff has received Anna's message, and he just hasn't answered yet. His face is like a read receipt. So given the receipt, and given the delay, we expect a disaligning response. And yet, Kristoff gives an aligning response. He says Anna's hair looks fine. Enter Olaf. Up pops his head and inserts his little commentary on the brief assessment exchange. Olaf points out that Kristoff's turn was late or delayed. Pointing out details like this serves to challenge them. Kristoff now has to account for why it was delayed. After all, if it were easy to say, oh no, it looks fine, he would have done so almost instantly. Kristoff's silence underlined the difficulty in making the assessment. Olaf's challenge ultimately casts doubt on whether Kristoff's delayed response was 100% truthful. Of course, since this is a movie and not a conversation analytic treatise, Kristoff simply denies flat out that there was any hesitation and changes the topic. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why Olaf is a conversation analyst. If you want to know more about conversation analysis, you should really read Harvey Sachs, Emmanuel Shagloff, and Gil Jefferson. They were the original conversation analysts, and in 1974, they first wrote about the phenomenon of response relevance. That paper went on to be the most cited paper in the history of the journal Language, which is one of the premier journals in linguistics. There's also a fantastic paper by Kendrick and Torreira of last year, which shows that silence doesn't always indicate a disagreeing response is upcoming. In fact, it takes a really long, well, conversationally long, silence before most people expect a disagreement. Silence is just one resource we have for indicating that we might be about to disagree. There are also other things silence can do, and other reasons why silence can happen. But if you laughed at Olaf and Frozen, it shows that you implicitly knew a hesitation can project a disagreement. It's a generalization, but it still makes for a good joke. <laughs>